but you grow up with that. It's accepted there is nothing beyond the ship, so you make space smaller to fit in with your world. As far as you're concerned, space may only be a meter deep. The only thing that suggests it's not is by spending hundreds of years traveling from one point of it to another. It's the Daniel's Nemesis podcast, reading chapter 8, watching videos with William. These days, internet celebrities and influencers are always selling you merchandise. They build the audience, then flog you stuff. The book they inevitably write comes years into their career. Here I am, giving away my book, before I have any audience at all. Yes, this is the book that I wrote when the internet was barely a thing. We had chat forums back then, not apps on a phone. This book has seen the rise of Friends Reunited, MySpace, Facebook. And now that governments are trying to break up the monopolies of such huge sites, this book is finally seeing the light of day. See, before the internet, we had imagination. And if that is an arrogant thing to say, you have not heard this podcast before. For success today, one needs polish. One needs to look like they have a massive budget and a whole crew behind the scenes. I have a novel that never went anywhere, and a microphone. And now your ears. X-Book, the classic story of aliens invading the Earth right after the First World War, as one character has a mental breakdown, and the other character is stuck centuries in the past. It's got maximum surrealism, it's got maximum ponderousness. It's got minimal actual story. What have you missed so far? Ginger took leave a month after the Great War ended and has taken his girlfriend Dee to the countryside. William, a Trascon, having reached Earth after centuries of travel, sees the only way to get onto Earth is to instigate an attack, a warning of which has been issued. Ginger is called back to base. Feels weird doing these catch-ups with some actual plot points to catch you up on. Anyway, just remember, this is fiction. Always fiction. Logic is as logic does. Chapter 8. Watching videos with William. I have been watching more of these videos that we have recorded of your planet. It has really kicked into me my lack of awareness of my own environment. I've been locked up in this spaceship my entire life. It's all I can know. You can never understand that. I've never thought about it before. I've never felt trapped before. It was just life as I knew it to be. If I had to describe my surroundings, I would describe them as safe. Safe from the absolute freezing cold and the airless vacuum of space outside. Do you know how empty space is? Not that empty. It stretches on forever, but it is so far that it is impossible. For darkness acts as a wall makes it look like there is an end to space. Stars just look like lights in the sky. But you grow up with that. It's accepted there is nothing beyond the ship, so you make space smaller to fit in with your world. As far as you're concerned, space may only be a meter deep. The only thing that suggests it's not is by spending hundreds of years traveling from one point of it to another. But that's something that only this last generation of people are distinctly aware of as we approach our goal, and something that only the first generation were aware of as they departed. Millions of billions of people in all the years in between 
have never needed to be aware of this. They were too far away from either planet to ever give it a second's thought. The nostalgia fades for the previous home, and the hope of a new home is too far away. This is your home, and there is nowhere else to go. But what about you on Earth? For you, exploration is everything. You can travel from one part of your world to another part of your world. You have that much freedom. To travel to a new home takes a matter of days at the most. So that journey can be the most exciting thing you can ever embark upon. To live in a city, but to move to the sea. To live in a desert and go to the lush rural areas of the countryside. You can experience something new every day if you choose. We cannot do that. For most, the furthest journey taken is to depart from their living place to their workplace. Families are not widespread because there is nowhere to spread to. For us, the most exciting thing we can do is to journey outwards into space in tiny little craft, the craft that have now become what they originally were our military craft. But that is dull and unexciting, as much as the prospect seems ideal to you. For us, we are going from one artificially created environment to a much smaller artificially created environment, never that far away from the mothership. For you, I'm sure it would be absolutely exciting, as you may one day find out. But for you, space is not an everyday part of life. It is beyond that. The land of the gods, the depths of it all, the uncharted space, the new experiences of being away from your natural world. Of course, it was all once like that for ourselves. But that was before we embarked on this journey, or rather, limbo life. Of course, if you were to come onto this ship, you would feel uncomfortable, imprisoned, confined. The inability to get away from walls would shock you. But you have that ability to feel freedom, to feel wonder at new sights, sounds, smells, experiences, to change your scenery, to go outside your house and to go inside your house. Everybody feels safer inside their house. And I guess that's kind of how we feel safer inside our house, our mothership. But there is so much more to your world than that. You have weather systems, seasons, natural light, natural darkness, unpredictable temperature changes, air, that feels free to move how it wants to move. You can also create that artificially to alter to your comforts with the aid of technology. But technology is all we have. I have been watching film footage that our craft had recorded of your planet. And it all seems so daft and so very, very frightening. I guess that's one advantage of being a supreme leader, or at least someone in such authority, that I can get access to these pieces of footage, that I can then have these thoughts, these private thoughts. I've always known about weather, of course everyone has, but it's something that is largely forgotten, as I believe happens to those people who live in climates that don't alter very much over the year. At least, that's what I'd guess. I'd feel that it's only in areas that have more unpredictable weather patterns that the weather becomes a focus. But ignoring that for now, everyone on board ship knows about weather. 
It's mentioned in old literature. It's mentioned in pieces of writing where people want to break away from it all. But these are very rare writings and have never sunk much into today's popular culture. Our planet had weather patterns too? Of course it did. There are broadcasts about Earth, informative broadcasts, where all dimensions of life there are dissected, from plants to animals, from geography to weather, and anything else you can think of. These are never in particular depth, and <laughs> they are so controlled that they never allow enough information for people to be able to let their own thoughts to expand on it. It's all back-of-the-mind stuff. But I have become aware of all this whilst watching a video of a town centre towards dusk in a smaller island country. Chosen because of its sea access, our smooths could enter over the ocean, creep inland where not so many would see it, make its escape, and take off over the ocean again. Now, though, all that secrecy is no longer needed. It is such an uneventful video. The scientists have found no traces of undiscovered technologies. Anthropologists have found no new behavioural patterns. It is routine footage of the kind that is often fast-forwarded through, speeding up time to gain quicker access to anything new. I too would have fast-forwarded through. Yet I saw a man stumble. It caught my eye. I did not immediately fast-forward. It was a sign of humans being human. Nothing new, we have much of that footage, but I started to gain more interest. I saw people going into buildings, people coming out of buildings, and then it started to rain. It's so subtle, you don't notice it at first. But a speck of rain hit the camera, followed by a couple more, a sudden blurring of the world, the start of something new, something fresh. Even with wipers, the outlook had changed, not just for me, but for everyone on the streets. Coats built with hoods finally make sense when they're pulled over the head to prevent getting wet. People putting up umbrellas, the streets beginning to shine. People walking quicker in time with the steadying of the rain. Running, even. Sometimes with newspapers held over the head. In a moment, everything has changed. The world is new, reborn. Others not even bothering to acknowledge the new world order where rain dominates. Continuing to just walk through the streets like nothing is happening. I rewind to watch again, slower this time. A drop falls past the camera, followed by three, five, countless. Light at first, soon heavier and bigger drops. Entirely random, seemingly from nowhere. I'm still on the bridge and needing security access. I call out to my security chief, Yurtjuk, to get me another tape. He quite audibly screams at another member of security staff to get me another tape. As if the scream isn't enough, he shoves him on his way. Soon enough, this member of security, who I believe is called Legout, comes back with a handful of tapes, two of which he drops when Yurtjuk yells at him for taking so long. Stooping down to pick up one of these dropped tapes, I then put it into the machine. This one is from last winter. This time it's snowing. The same chemicals and substances as rain, but an entirely different context. These drops are frozen, yet they dance in the air. They land softly on the snow that has already formed on the floor. 
its frozen state of hardness, not allowing it to be washed away, but to remain with the sun shining on the snow. Children are playing. It is no wonder that this weather system is acknowledged with love, so much more in pictures, in talk, on cards, everywhere. But why, when snow is so much more dangerous? Rain comes, gets you wet, but feeds the crops, whereas snow comes to kill the crops. It is cold to touch. Ice can cause accidents. The cold brings diseases. Is there a beauty in this danger? The landscape has altered. What were once green fields, grey buildings, have all become a uniform white. Amazing to look at from a spectator's point of view. But where is the real beauty? What is the real beauty? No, I just don't understand. I can get rain whenever I want, but in small, confined spaces. That's from my shower. I never find that interesting. So why bother with all this rain? I can get snow and ice from my freezer. I could cover my room in it if I want. Try to simulate a snow-covered field or something. But what's the use? It would still be my room and I would know that I would have to tidy up. It would be my mess to clear, not some supernatural force controlling the conditions of each day. You have languages as well. That's liberating. That helps with the idea of escape. But I can never escape because I am too scared to come to Earth. It's too unpredictable. The ozone layer being your only protection from us, the sun and space. It would not feel safe. Trapped in the confines of my mind, would I ever leave my house if I was to have one? I feel tempted to carry on past this planet, back into the depths of space. But I know that my fate has been sealed now. I both envy you and am jealous of you. I want to kill you, kill to have that as we deserve, but also... I admire you for your bravery. I feel that you may have something to offer, a courage, but time will tell. This is the Trascon mothership, the fleet having traveled through the depths of space, a journey with such significance for us that the only entity that can match it is the Trascon world itself or at least the idea of the Trascon homeland. With a destination charted for the fleet that was to last a journey of 850 years, we have finally come to the promised land. For the first time in nearly a millennia has it finally been allowed to slow down. Soon, the fleet may go the same way as the Trascon homeland, as it is deserted in the pursuit of greater lands. And that is important, for this journey has given the fleet the status of a world, albeit one played out in Fast Forward, for it has carried life. Many generations of life. It has had many major dramas played out on it. It has experienced wars. It has seen the great pursuit of science and technology. It has seen the expansion of the race known as Trascons. The one factor that the scientists on Trasconia solve. The one factor that meant that life on board ship, already cramped and claustrophobic, could only get worse and deteriorate. Supplies went down quicker than expected. Rationing was brought in. After so many years, the now empty supply decks could be built into. And the race started. Lack of supplies meant that space could be used for the growing population. 
Would the space be created quickly enough? That was the first question. But with more and more people, would there be enough food? That was the answer that was given. However, this ship that has been steadily growing inside is about to give birth to release to the emptiness outside many of its smaller ships. We are soon to colonize the Earth, the Blue Planet. General Notes Okay, okay, so I accidentally gave a spoiler in the previous episode. I've fallen into the trap that I knew I was inevitably going to fall into. I talked about something that seemed like it was a mere expository detail, when, in fact, it was a revelatory detail in a chapter that hadn't been released yet. This was going to happen. Analyzing chapter by chapter a book that I know very well, I am occasionally going to take some things for granted as known when, in fact, they are not known. I just need to be more careful. That detail? That supplies a running low on the Trascon ships. This adds stakes and a consequence to William if he doesn't continue with getting the Trascons to Earth by whatever means. It's a new dimension and an interesting one. Besides, with the extreme length of the last episode and the accidental spoiler and the repeated awareness that I am stepping into death of the author territory, I think for all those reasons that I need to follow the less is more philosophy. Less because it makes for a shorter, more enjoyable episode. Less because I don't risk giving away so many spoilers. And less so that I can give you some food for thought without telling you what to think. Don't you want readers to focus more on the book rather than your analysis? What's your goal here? Oh, that's just the me from the past. He pops up every now and then to have his little say, thinking that I've changed too much in the last decade and a half since this book was last looked at. Well, listener, if you want, you can tune out now if all you want is the novel. I mean, he's right. The rest of this podcast is just analysis. So, I was talking about giving away key details. Well, that was at the end of the chapter. What about the rest of the chapter? What do you say about a chapter where someone has only been watching vids? Well, I guess I can talk about world building. We've learned about the insides of Ginger's head. We've learned about the history of the Trascons and how they've got to this point. What we haven't had much of is an actual description of the physical worlds that both inhabit. Well, it seems that in this chapter, I may have kind of been addressing that point. William is looking at Ginger's world and talking about it. We may know little about what the Trascon ship looks like, whereas we now know what Earth weather is like. If you're from Wales, as I am, you are probably over-familiar with weather, as Wales is the land of the horizontal rain. But with a character looking outwards, and at their present, at least I was making steps in building the world that the story takes place in. So, let's examine this in a bit more detail. What is world building? I've enjoyed a fair few Sebastian Falk's books in my time, but I guess that level of descriptive detail was not for me. Sebastian Falk's goes into a level of world building that I feel is a bit extreme. But I do get at something that adds some texture, if not substance. At a basic level, world building is describing not just the physical appearance of the world the characters inhabit, 
but describing the rules of how the world works, the geography as well as the socio-economic factors. I'll get into all of that later, but let's look at another aspect of world building. The way that you describe a world should say a lot about where the characters are at that stage in the story. Worlds that seem strange to the audience are often strange to the character as well, and focus will go on certain details that emphasize that strangeness. If a strange world is known to a character, then what is strange to us will be normal to a character and be treated as such in the narration of a story. Film is particularly good at world building. The way that a character is framed, for example, behind bars, shows imprisonment of some kind, even if those bars are not part of a prison, but maybe a feature of a window. If a character's in an expansive area, that shows some kind of freedom. Where the camera is positioned and how it looks at a character tells us a lot. Likewise, how the camera looks at the world tells us something of the character's perspective. Let's look at film noir and the movies that inspired that genre, German Expressionism, also known as Weimar Cinema. Film noir is usually set in a contemporary world to the production, with the world mirroring one that the audiences were familiar with. However, film noir also used heavy lighting to set the mood and transform that recognizable world into something new. This was due to the often low budgets and bare walls, so lighting and shadows played a dominant part in the visual aesthetic, but also helped build this grimy, murky, dark underworld where danger appears at every turn. Basically, film noir used a budgetary constraint to its artistic advantage. German Expressionism had previously developed this with its worlds of horror and fantasy, Caligari having very stylized sets depicting a dream world. Fritz Lang used gigantic sets in Metropolis to create claustrophobic and terrifying workhouses depicting humans becoming, in effect, part of the machinery contrasted with expansive areas that the bourgeoisie had a lot of freedom in. Then there's the infamous scene in Nosferatu where you only see the shadow of the monster approaching the victim. I could go on forever about German Expressionism, but these worlds were built with light doing a lot of the heavy work to set the tone of the worlds portrayed. And they are wonderfully constructed worlds that have me practically orgasming to look at despite these movies now being about a century old. But, famously, an image tells a thousand words, and films have a lot of images. Books and novels have a lot more work to do. There is a reason why there can be a lot of detail to describe each new place a character walks into. Economy with adjectives is not often deployed. I mentioned Sebastian Falks earlier, who really puts more importance on his world than his stories, at least in my view. Or he just likes showing how much research he's done. I don't know. However, I never really studied the art of world building. I was taught to look at the mise-en-scene. Mise-en-scene is the arrangement and composition within an image including the placement of a character, a prop, and what is in the background. The placement of any object in a screen can be seen as important in some way. For example, it can be metaphorical or symbolic. Or it can be there just to make the background look good. I treat world building details in a similar way to how someone constructs a film image. 
I place the camera of my mind's eye in a particular direction and only what is seen in my mind at the moment is commented on. Very little of the external world penetrates into either character's consciousnesses, and when it does, it gets scrutiny. Kind of like we don't get to see what's behind the camera in a movie. Every world is 360 degrees, but only a few of those degrees get looked at at any particular time. Knowing this kind of informs my approach to what the characters look at, and what they scrutinize, and consequently what you, the reader, get to know about my worlds. But there's some other aspects as well. I never built up Ginger's world, both because I didn't have enough research, but also because it is a world that is documented, is known, is imaginable. William's world is his normal to him, so he doesn't describe it much. How often do you walk into a kitchen and pour adjectives onto the mug you are about to drink coffee from? Extend this to a room you are in every single day. Do you really examine it in excruciating detail every single day? This novel deploys first-person narration from both characters. This therefore determines how details are given. The details given are about them and where they are. The worlds I am building revolve around them and how external both characters are to their individual worlds. The details are from their perspective with less regard to the reader. Were I to narrate this from a third-person perspective, details would emerge as the reader enters a new environment, not the character unless the character has never been there before as well. For example, William pours more scrutiny on Earth than Ginger would because Earth is the strange new world to William. The details he looks at are the details that interest him, humans just being human. Perhaps not dancing like nobody's watching, but just going about their day to day as if no one is watching. In terms of expositional world building, William looks back, partly because it is his job to know about his civilization, but also because there is some kind of envy that Trascons of the past never had to do what he is doing. He looks back perhaps because he desires to be there and not in his own present. And yeah, it's also convenient exposition. World building says a lot about a story and its characters. Many authors really build up the worlds in almost excessive, if not self-indulgent, detail. I refrain from the details. If my characters are separate from the worlds around them, so should the reader be. William describes his relationship to his metal home as safe. He describes others' relationships to it as well. Brief details about them traveling from home to work and families not spreading out much. He describes looking out at space and seeing it as a wall rather than endless possibility. There is a conflict of interest. Less food equals more habitable space, but a larger population means a more rapid decrease in food. I am attempting to take the camera and use it from the character's point of view. In essence, as a character becomes aware of something, I am positioning it within the camera frame. Have I not made it clear in previous podcasts that I had a filmmaker's approach to writing a literary novel. It's becoming a bit more clear now, isn't it? William's world 
is that of being confined, and the politics of a civilization also confined. If you are disappointed that I never gave a lot of details to describe what William looks at, then how about this? This is how I would describe it in a script. Grey, a bit darker grey, lighter grey, with grime. His technology? 850 years old, with random upgrades done at various times over the centuries. A hodgepodge of old and newer technology that is not that much of an upgrade anyway. By 21st century human standards, the technology looks fairly primitive, but functional. But why should I be giving you details now, when I didn't back then? After all, if it's not on the page, it's not there at all. Then stop explaining everything! <laughs> oh, long time ago version of me. What are the rules? I'm not sure I was ever sure of the world rules. I mean, I'm still not sure now, so there was no way that I could have done back then. I mean, let's face it, one of my characters is Ginger, where almost anything can go, at least internally. Looking back, though, I can see lots of details that could be played on, developed as motivation for actions, that some of the smaller characters later take. But I am still around Act 1. I'm still in the establishing area here. I don't need to change the world that the characters are in yet, or introduce a new set of rules. At least a new set of rules on the vague rules already established. The rules at the moment are that of a fairly normal world that we all live in. Yes, that includes the Trascons on board their spaceships. I was anthropomorphizing this group of aliens. It's easier, after all, to have aliens with a human-like civilization than create an entire alien civilization from scratch. Bearing in mind I never fully developed the rules of the world, let's go into some of the details of how it works. The geography of the mothership. William mentions that, for most Trascons, their world is going from their living space to their workspace. What are those workspaces? I imagine their living quarters as being something from Red Dwarf or Star Trek, kind of sci-fied versions of apartments or flats. But what are their jobs? Do they have shops and restaurants like us? How does manufacturing work? Exports? William also says that they stay close to their families as there is nowhere to spread to. Does this mean that different types of jobs are fairly spread out across the entire mothership if not fleet, of gigantic ships. For us, we travel to different cities because we can't get the job we want in the place we grew up. Many industries are based in certain areas, dotted around the country. In the UK, manufacturing is pushed to towns like the one I grew up next to. Farming is in the countryside, but the big banking, economic, entertainment jobs tend to be centralised in big cities, particularly London. When writing this, I was still a naive little country boy. I didn't understand how the job market works. I barely do now, to be honest. I didn't understand the way towns and cities worked. The village I grew up in was a place where people lived. One shop, a couple of pubs, and that was it, employment-wise. Looking at larger, more urban areas, I couldn't distinguish between the suburbs and the financial districts. I didn't have enough knowledge of city or even town life 
to break things down enough to be able to build them back up in a new alien world. I don't think the ideas of towns and cities existing on the ships even came back to me then. I did, however, have a concept of each ship representing a different country, and I think that was it. However, geography and later industry is an area that fascinates me in Discworld. Terry Pratchett was always bringing in new industries into the Discworld, giving us a clearer picture of how Ankh-Morpork worked, as well as the regions around Ankh-Morpork, if not other countries very distant from that city. Typically, through the Watch or Lord Veterinary, the Despot Patrician, we got to see how these new industries impacted the world we have known and built up in our minds through many books. World building was something Terry Pratchett was good at, as he literally built an entire world in his imagination. But it also took Terry Pratchett many, many books to introduce all these new ideas, these new slices of life, and over many decades as well. Sometimes you have to draw your limits. I think I was wise to draw my limits where they were. It's a case of micro and meta-narratives again. Micro-narratives of the socio-economic world. You can't represent everyone. But with the introduction of new characters, Legault and Yurtjuk, this micro-narrative represents larger power struggles being played out across the Trascon civilization. By screaming and shoving, Yurtjuk is determining his authority, and Legault is the naive foil to that. We finally get a small slice of life on board the ship outside of William and Skirnage. We have a sense of a world of hierarchies with William at the top as the supreme leader, but also a world where aggression towards a perceived minor is accepted. It's interesting to me that I happen to bring in new characters as William stops looking to the past and starts looking to the present, even if it is the present of the Earth more than the present on his own ship. And as we have only just been introduced to these two new characters, I should stop talking about them here. William world builds Ginger's terrain. Yes, William is looking more at Earth in this chapter, perhaps more than his own world. And isn't it funny that it's actually William who describes more of Ginger's external world than Ginger does. For William, it's important for him to analyze Earth, to study it. We get little details like why the UK is focused on. Apparently not because it's the hub of an empire where the sun is always shining, but because it's a small country where the smooths can get in and out of easily. Not bad thinking, old me. Accepted. I do get things right occasionally, O oh master of my psyche. Go away. I'm on your side this time. You can tell by the more sincere tone. Understanding the weather systems would be important to a leader. One's got to know how it's going to affect a civilization that has done without weather for centuries. Had I had more smarts, I could have maybe talked about the crops. That's surely something William would want to know about, if they are rationing their own food. But William doesn't look at that. Because I didn't write it. But it's not the only issue that is truly bothering him. He's looking at the weather because it's alien to him, and he attempts to contextualize it in a way he can understand. And William states that he is not looking at the things the scientists and anthropologists have been over countless times. William 
is watching videos as if he is psyching himself up to enter Earth. He is our audience surrogate, as the observer. Well, he's got a dual role, even in this chapter as he begins, as he has done in a few chapters, by narrating his race's history, even if it is from a distance of centuries. But as a narrator, he knows more than the reader. In the second half of the chapter, he moves into observer role. As the observer, he becomes a good audience surrogate. By that, I mean William can look at the rules of the world and how the world operates. Also, William is in another good position to act as an audience surrogate. He seems separated from everything that is going on around him. He's alienated from his current home. He's alienated from his potential future home. He looks at Ginger's world as if it is alien to everything he understands. In other words, he is learning as the reader is. World building and narrative structure. So what is William seeing here? And is this foreshadowing? I don't want to spoil things, so let's go through this with a bit of care. How does this world building contrast with the previous world building that he's done previously? So far, we have just had world building through exposition dump. In previous chapters, this is seemingly all it has been. However, I feel I managed to finally have the exposition impact William's story. As William goes into exposition, a new plot point is revealed, that being the lack of rations. Blake Snyder, in his book, Save the Cat, talks about the Pope in the pool. The Pope in the pool is a way to get over lengthy exposition by putting a character in a surprising situation. For example, we think of the Pope giving sermons. We picture him waving from inside his Pope mobile. Who thinks of a Pope in a pool? In one such script that Snyder refers to, this happens as a load of exposition is dumped on the audience. It doesn't impact anything story-wise, but by having the Pope relate exposition in a strange place, it combats the boredom many suffer from hearing too much exposition. Ultimately, whether or not you dress the exposition up in a fancy way, as Blake Snyder suggests, there has to be a reason why, as a writer, you go on at length about events prior to or circulating the story. I have accepted I am exposition heavy. So, what is my reasoning for having so much exposition in the chapters concerning William to date? I am getting from events that started centuries, if not millennia ago, to where William is right now. Not only does it help explain the general psychology of the Trascons and the cabin fever, and why they are keen to get off the ship and onto Earth. But it helps explain why William, who clearly would prefer to be an observer, is having to go against his natural inclinations to have to step foot on Earth. In other words, things that have happened a long time in the past are impacting William now. Through all this exposition, we get more of a sense of William's internal conflict. That conflict being, one, wanting to go past Earth and continue the life he has always known. Two, wanting to kill to get onto Earth, therefore being trapped into events as they are happening. Three, his admiration for humans and the world they live on. Why does William have this conflict? It took 
a massive series of events beginning with a son dying to get to where William is now. Imagine if there were a common goal that all humans had that would take a thousand years to complete. Imagine all those people who developed technologies that had to last for centuries. Imagine all those people who created plans for 850 years after their own lives. Imagine all those people whose hopes were for their descendants nearly a millennia later. Imagine all those lives of people trapped on a ship spread over 850 years, forced into a life they cannot escape. No home to return to, and no hope of getting off at the next stop. Imagine you were the person who had to honour the shared goal of an entire race for an entire millennia. It might prey on your mind as well, wouldn't it? However, is all this exposition too talking heady? Should I strip it down and focus only on details that will be relevant later on? No. I always wanted to create a history book for an alternate world. This was my self-indulgence. Besides that, I feel there is more structure in this world building than in the main story. There is a sense of a beginning, middle, end. There is a sense of conflict in the Trascon history, and even how the weather systems on Earth interact and affect human life, as we see in the video that William watched. It's all subtle. But I feel it works. William jumps around in history, as well as the world of the ship and the world of Earth. But it's all deliberate and is designed to create contrasts as well as a sense of story. This helps us understand William and his place in everything more. I do show. I just narrate over the showing, but I feel it's justified. Also, a sense of jeopardy is introduced right at the end, that of supplies. The Trascons are running out of food. The implied jeopardy is that with the humans and Trascons sharing Earth, would Earth supply enough food for its suddenly increased population? Another overarching question for the reader, and another problem for William to tackle. Furthermore, there is a contrast in the weather scene. It's like the weather also becomes a metaphor. We have snow from a previous winter, then rain from much more recent footage. The snow represents lifelessness, but in a romanticized form. The snow completely alters the world in damaging ways. Yet the world is still and peaceful and has children playing. The danger is present, but is often glamorized by us humans. The rain footage is different. Rain is a life giver to William, yet this time we see people running, trying to hide away from it, making the world more frantic. What is the contrast a metaphor for? Well, I'll leave you to think about that. Perhaps the word foreshadowing might give you a clue. Closing. It may not be the best chapter in terms of story progression. It may be a heavy talking head exposition dump. But I like this chapter. I like reflective William. I like knowing that I wrote stuff like this, whether or not it's right for a story. It's right for my story. It's my voice, my observations, my headspace. William is me. I thought I was Ginger. I identify more with William. 
Besides, I had way much more fun taking scant detail from books I was reading and creating the worlds in my head than being told what to picture all the time, back when I was an obsessive reader. To summarize this whole chapter briefly though, I guess that I'm beginning to get across the idea that William will soon be entering the second act, where the world will change for him. I guess this is a bit of a reconnaissance mission into the second act, arming him with facts before he really needs to jump across the first act turning point. So, before I say farewell, what do we have to look forward to in the next chapter? Well, Ginger packs his bags in order to return to base. Scintillating. Until next time, TTFN. And just in case you're wondering, all text was written by me, Daniel's nemesis. Our next book is purely a work of fiction and is not meant to be based on anyone or any events at all. The music was also by me, Daniel's nemesis, as was the image that accompanied this podcast. It sucks, doesn't it? But there we go. 